to the light. Listen, if you don't mind, just repeat after me. Father God, I'm here today seeking a word from you. So open my ears that I can hear. Touch my heart so that I will feel. And renew in me a right mind so that I will do. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, Luke chapter 15, Luke the physician, chapter 15. We'll be reading a few verses. I'm going to read to you verses 1 and 3, and then we're going to skip over to 11 and 13. And in the hearing of the word of God, it simply says in verse 15, chapter 1, 15 verse 1. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. But the, prophecy, the, the, but the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Verse 3. So he told them this parable. It really probably should have said these parables, but it says this parables. Let's skip over to, to one of the three parables that's going to be found in verse 11. And it says, and he, be, he, said, he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. Verse 13. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. For a moment today, I want to lift up this passage of scripture as we begin this new series entitled uh, Lost But Found. And I'm simply going to title this message today, It's Not That Simple. It's not that simple. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're thankful for all that God is doing. It's not that simple. What's not that simple? Life is not that simple. Earlier this morning, as we kicked this off, I got a chance to tell a story about us traveling. And I was going to the airport. And as I was on my way to the airport, I, I was telling people I hate airports. I just can't stand going through there. You have to take off your shoes, your socks. It's just so many. If you got laptops, you got to pull it out your bag. It's just so many things that you got to do. And I, I could not stand it. I did not want to be a part of it. I did not want to go through it. But in order for me to get from one place to the other place, it required me to fly through there. I couldn't just drive this route. I had to fly through there. And so here I am leaving at the airport and I'm going through the process and I'm going to get my bag checked. I purposely have worn sandals so that I don't have to have on socks. I can just flip my shoes off and walk through the little scanty thing real quick so they can find out I don't have what they think I might have. And so I go through this process and the first thing that I did, and I told them this morning that Pastor Ian, you would be excited about this. The first thing I did when I got across that threshold is I went to Starbucks. Uh, yes, sir. I went to Starbucks and I went to, to buy me a cup of coffee for everybody that's here that's, that's part of the church. Y'all know Pastor Ian is the only person that will come in here with Starbucks every morning and every evening. It makes no difference. So I went to Starbucks in honor of Pastor Ian to get me a coffee. I couldn't remember how many espressos and shots and things that he normally does. So I just simply got me a white chocolate mocha. And so they, they got me my drink. I got my drink and then I'm leaving and I, I just asked Tiffany, hey, do you want something from here? Do you want, this is Starbucks, this is the best coffee they have in the land. Uh, Pastor Ian swears by it, uh, get you a peppermint mocha or whatever you want. You can get it here. What, what, what is it that you, you want? She said, oh, I don't want nothing. I'm good. Okay, so I'm fine with that. And we grab our belongings and we continue on. We're on the way. I'm getting ready to get in line to get on the plane. And as I'm getting in line to get on the plane, she says, um, I think I want one of my, my mocha things from McDonald's. Now check it. I just asked you if you wanted the real thing from Starbucks and you're going to tell me you want one of these imitation things from McDonald's. But you know what? I, I had to respect it. So we go to McDonald's to get one of those imitation coffee shaking frozen things. So we're there and she gets this and then she orders some type of muffin or, or whatever it is that she gets. And then we leave there and we're preparing to board the plane. In the process of preparing to board the plane, all of a sudden I've realized I don't have my luggage. I'm, I'm missing my luggage. The first thing I do is I get mad at McDonald's. I wouldn't have left my luggage there. So here she is. She's trying to be helpful and walk with me. I'm like, I don't want you to walk with me. Stay over there. Make sure the plane don't leave me. And so the people tell me, go to the lost and found. That's, that's where your, your luggage is. Go to the lost and found. So I, I went back to McDonald's and that's what they told me. And so I go to the lost and found. Now I'm wondering, why did you move my luggage so fast? 
But of course, they have this thing that comes over the loudspeaker that says any un, any unattended luggage will be removed. It will be taken away. Ever since 9/11, you can't just leave things around in the airport. So they tell me my luggage has been taken to the lost and found. So now I'm passing back by Tiffany. Did you find? No, I didn't find it. I'm going to the lost and found to get my luggage. Keep in mind, the plane is getting ready to leave. I don't. I could be stuck here. So I get to the lost and found. It's dark. It's just a lady sitting out front. And I say, listen, they told me that my luggage from McDonald's, they said it's been brought over here. It's a little blue bag, a carry-on. It's been brought over here. And um, she says, well, I can't give it to you. Lost and found doesn't open up for three hours. I, I'm baffled. Said, Hold on. Wait. Listen, they just brought my stuff to you and you can't give it to me? For three hours, I'm going to miss my plane. Well, sir, there's nothing we can do. And, and, and I said, but they just brought it. And eventually she caught on to what I was saying. And she was like, no, they couldn't have just bought it because we're not open. Mm. So you need to go back and maybe you need to check the station where you checked in. They probably took it there because lost and found isn't open. So I go back to the station where I checked in, the place that I hate, where I have to take off my shoes and walk through the metal detector. And I get there and they have this plexiglass and I'm looking through this plexiglass and there on the other side is my luggage. My luggage is sitting on the other side. And so I went over there with this attitude, like, y'all gonna give me my luggage. And then I get there and I'm like, oh, that's my luggage right there. I, I see what belongs to me on the other side of the glass. And when I get there, I go to this woman and I tell this woman, hey, I left my luggage at McDonald's because uh, my wife made me leave it because we were there and they brought my luggage down here. And she says, no, that's not, you didn't leave your luggage at McDonald's. I, I said, what? oh, I didn't tell you that part, did I? Uh, my bad. <laughs> and she said, no, you didn't leave your luggage at McDonald's. I said, what do you mean? I know I left it there, but I went to McDonald's and they told me to go to Lost and Found. I went to Lost and Found and they told me that this probably was brought down here. And she said, sir, you never took your luggage through the process. <laughs> Listen, I was so mentally lost. I, I, I was so upset that I even had to go through the process. I walked through the process, never pushing my luggage through, only walking through with what I had in my hand. I left my luggage outside because I never had to go in. Now, guess what? I had to go through the process twice where I only had to go through it once. I had to go through the process twice where I only should have went through it once. Life is not that simple. Sometimes we go through processes twice that we should only go through once. Now, I'm going to teach this text from a different perspective because oftentimes when we hear this text, all we hear about is a father's love, how you come back to God and he's going to forgive you, which that is in there. That's most definitely in there. And we're going to get to that. But I think the importance of this text is to understand the first key point that Jesus was trying to stress. After all, it was in verses one through two that Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees and the scribes in the first place when they said, listen, what's wrong with you over there eating with these tax collectors and those sinners? And the Bible says that he went on to tell them this parable. The reason why I want you to understand, because sometimes people confuse parables with riddles. And a parable is not a riddle. Pastor, what's the difference between a parable and a riddle? Well, a riddle takes the truth and it hides it in hope that you don't find it. That's the purpose of a riddle. It takes the truth and hides it in hope that you don't find it. Why do you bring this up? Because some people read parables and get confused. But a parable is not intended to confuse you. Its, it's, it's purpose is actually the opposite. To take what would confuse you and make it plain for you to understand. What is it that Jesus is trying to make plain within this text? Well, he's trying to make plain the fact that the Pharisees and the scribes, these holy, righteous Christian folks, don't understand why he's kicking it with sinners. They don't get it. They don't comprehend it. It doesn't make sense to them. And see, if Jesus wanted to say it, all Jesus had to say was, listen, uh, I'm the son of God and I've come to redeem all that have that sin. And because of that, I can't leave anyone behind. That's all he had to say. But because of the state of mind, the confusion, the lostness that they were already in, guess what happened? He said, I'm going to have to make this plain for you. And I have to make it so plain that I got to tell you three parables instead of just one. I got to give you three examples in one parable to make sure I don't miss anybody. I want to make sure that everybody has what I'm trying to say. So what does Jesus do? He goes in and he says, let me tell you the first parable. I want to tell you the parable of a shepherd that lost a sheep. He had a hundred of them, but somehow one of them went astray. Somehow he lost one. And he asked him, would it make any sense 
to let that one go astray, what would you do? Why would he, he tell this story? Because he knew that there were some people that, that identified with being shepherds that was there. So in other words, I have to make sure you understand the importance of how one person is to me as one sheep is to you. You would leave 99 sheep in a place where you think that they're protected and safe to go hunt for that one before that wolf finds them. So that's why Jesus is eating with sinners and these lost folk. Because of the fact one is just important as the 99. In other words, I got 99 problems, but this one, I got to fix it. And then you take it, he says, listen, not only do I have, am I able to tell you about the sheep, but let me tell you, for those who don't have sheep, for those who value your money. He tells you a, a parable of a, a young lady that had 10 silver coins and she lost one of them. And she lost one of them and it, basically she told her house up looking for that one coin. He had to make sure the people that understood that, that valued money understood the importance of what happens when you lose one. In other words, if I had a dollar worth of dimes and I lost a dime, you think I'm going to go to the 99 cent store with 90 cents? I got to find that other dime. I need that other dime to purchase whatever I want. That dime has value to me, to what I want, to what I'm looking for. And so he stressed the importance of if you lost a sheep, if you lost a coin, you would look for it. You would stay in the place where they are until you find it. You would search your couch. You would look up under the rug, under the seat of your car, in your neighbor's pastures, wherever they are, you're going to stay there until you find it. This is what he teaches us. But of all parables, and that was just two, there's a third one, the prodigal son, probably the most famous of them all. And it's something about that parable that really sticks out to me. And I feel like with any person that studies the Bible, it's, and it's in verses 11 through 16 that you're going to find out, it's going to define that there was this man, he had two sons. One was the youngest, one was the oldest. And in him having two sons, what took place is that the youngest son somehow decided one day to come to his father and say, give me uh, the portion of the estate that belongs to me. That's what he, he tells them. And the father said, okay, here you go. And so the son took the state, and once he took the state, the Bible says he went to a far country, and he swindled everything he had. He lost everything with his rich, lavish, loose, as the Bible describes it, living. And it got to the point where it got so bad within his life that a famine had attacked the land that he was in. A famine had attacked the land that he was in. As a result of it, he's broke, he's hungry, and he's looking for work. And so therefore, what takes place next? He decides to lease himself out, rent himself out, sell himself out to an individual within the city for work. And he's feeding the pigs. He's feeding the pigs the leftovers that the master had given to the servant, and the servant has decided that it's good enough now to throw to the pigs. And he is the servant, the slave, that has the job of throwing it to the pigs. <laughs> and the thing that gets me about this text more than anything is because in the process of him feeding the pigs, he got to a place within his life that was so low that he said, I'm going to eat what the pigs are eating. That's what he said. And you know why he said that? He said it because no one was giving him anything. No one was giving him anything. Here it is that someone that had everything he could possibly ever ask for is now in a position where he has nothing. Lost, but with the potential of being found. I want us to break down a few things within this text. Because we oftentimes in our life mirror the prodigal son. Oftentimes in our lives, we look just like him. What do you mean, Pastor? I've, I've never abandoned my father. I've never, never asked for what didn't belong to me. I, I didn't, I never done that. We do it to God every day. We do it to God every day. And I can say that because I do it. 
I wake up with a spirit of expectancy, declaring that God is going to give me something. And sometimes when it doesn't go exactly how I want it, I get a little sad and about it, and I feel like God has let me down. We do it every day. And so one of the first points that I want us to understand when we look at this is to value, to understand what does it mean to be lost and how do you get lost. And I, I'm here to take today to tell you that the first place that you get lost is in your mind. Many of us sitting in this very room, we're going through life, but we're lost mentally. Our train of thought is all jacked up. Where we see purple is really blue. We don't see life. And why is that? Because we're looking through a, a lens of sin. Listen, I, I, I can feel a shift right now. We're looking through a lens of sin. Our perspective is all messed up. Pastor Ian wears glasses and, and, and Brother Akron wears glasses. But I can't switch their prescriptions and expect them to see the same thing. If one's nearsighted and one's farsighted, their glasses are not going to work on each other. And see, some of us mess up because we try to look at life through other folks' glasses. We try to look at life through what other people are doing. And we expect to get the same results that they get when they're not our glasses. Their eyes are not my eyes. This is what happens with this prodigal son. He loses his mind. Pastor, why do you say he lost his mind? I can say he lost his mind because if you read the King James or the New King James, where the NASB calls it an estate, the New King James and the King James calls it is his inheritance. Now, listen, my mother specializes in life insurance. And so I know what an inheritance is. I don't need Webster to define inheritance. Inheritance is what you receive after someone has died. That's what is left to you. That's what belongs to you after someone has died. So check this. My daddy is still alive, but I'm asking him for what belongs to me after he's dead. There's a point in time that I'm supposed to receive what he has for me. But the problem is, I want it now. I don't care if you're not dead. You know what's owed to me when you die. Let's split that right now. And the thing is, the father said, you know what? I love you enough here. You can have it. The boy lost his mind. I wish I would go to my dad and tell him, give me what you owe me right now while you're still alive. That's, that's key point right there. Listen. You, you, I dare you call Prom America. Listen, I know my dad is supposed to die in 10 years. Give me the check right now. You can't declare that I want what's for tomorrow today. That's good. That's good. Many of us are walking through life steady begging and pleading God what's for tomorrow when we haven't fulfilled what we're supposed to do today. This is the mistake that we make in our lives. We're asking God for what's promised, our inheritance, but we're not even working and living like we're supposed to live right now. This boy should appreciate his daddy. He should love his daddy. One day, one day his daddy is not going to be there, but he's not worried about that. He, he wants to pay off. He doesn't want to go through the things that he has to go through to appreciate what he's going to receive later. He wants to pay out right now. And not only does he want the payout right now that shows us that he's messed up mentally, but the Bible says that he takes what his father gives him and then he goes and get everything else. That's the difference. That wasn't what his father gave him. It says he went back and got everything else. In other words, he went back and got his bedding. He got his clothes. He got his new pair of kicks. Everything that belonged to him. He made sure when he left his daddy's house, no one ever knew that he was there. He took everything with him and left. We know what happens next. He goes on to swindle it. But before we get to that point, I want to make sure you understand what happens when you lose your mind. Not only do you try to declare what's for tomorrow, it's for today. But then you take everything that God has given you and walk out of the presence of God. 
This is what this young man did. He took everything that his father had ever given him, everything that he had, every picture that was on the wall, whatever he had in that house, he took it and left. That's what happened within this passage. When you lose your mind, it puts you in a bad place. And some of us don't understand why we're going through it that we've lost our mind. Listen, I thank God that my heavenly father is not like this father that was in this illustration. Why? Because this father said, I love you enough to give it to you. But my father said, I love you enough not to give it to you. Why is it important for God to love you enough not to give it to you? Because if I give it to you, you're going to do the second thing that he did. Not only did he lose his mind, but he lost all his possessions. In other words, everything that the father, and I want you to identify with his father as our heavenly father. Everything that the father had given him, guess what? He lost it. So that means every blessing, every breakthrough, Everything that he had ever mastered when in his life, when he left the father, he took it all with him. That's what the Bible says. He, he left no trace. He took it all with him and he went on to lose all of his possession. Some of us are in that situation right now. We feel like our lives are falling apart. We're losing everything that we have around us. You need to check yourself. Have I lost my mind? Because what is it that put me in this situation? Have, have, I, have I really just lost my mind? Let me go back and backtrack and see what happened. I want you to understand this because this is what has to happen in this text. This young man has to realize, listen, I've, I've put myself in a bad place. I put myself in a bad situation that has caused me to lose everything. And I want you to really retain the power of what this says. In order for you to understand it, you got to understand what he did. Number one, he took everything that he had and the Bible says he left and went to a faraway what? Land. He left the presence of God, his father, and went to a far away, what? Land. So if we flip this, when you leave the presence of God, where are you going? To the presence of the enemy. So if, if, if I take what God has given me right here, right now, and I decide to leave God, I'm not leaving him to go to New York. I'm not leaving him to go to California. When I leave God, no matter where I go on the face of this earth, so even if I stay where I am in this place, in this pulpit right now, if I stay right here but I spiritually leave God, I've now, what, left God's presence to go to the presence of the enemy. That's very important because some of us think that we can take the gifts that God gives us and take them to the presence of the enemy, which we consider the world, and think they're still going to function the same. This is what's happening within the text. This dude was gifted. He was a beautiful singer, but he gets over here and wants to sing for the world, and now he got strung out on dope. This dude was gifted on the instruments, but he gets over here and wants to play for the world, and he can't keep a gig. Dude was gifted in financials, but now he stays broke. Many of us are taking the gifts that God has given us, and because God has said, here, you can have them, you've taken them, and you're using them in the wrong place, which now leaves you broke and desperate. You lose all of your possessions. You've taken the, the wonderful gift, and you've tried to utilize it as a skilled. And the fact of the matter is the great thing about a gift is that it was given to you. And the wonderful thing about our God, he never takes it away. It's yours. You can have it. But the thing about it is when you leave the presence of God, which means you leave his safety, you leave his covering, you leave his love, you leave his compassion, you leave it all to go where? To the world. And the world is controlled by someone totally different. Since the beginning of time, he's tried to take what was God. And since the beginning of time, he's lost every time. But the thing about it is when you leave God and come to him, he wants to take everything that you got because he knows you got it from God. And he knows he can't rob you of it. So what he does is he makes it seem so minute. This is why so many of our our, our gospel artists that try to go secular and they sing it and, and they and they trying to make this thing happen and they saying, listen, it's hard. It's a struggle out here. It's so many of us. You're right. It's a bunch of y'all on that road to darkness. 
And that's why if you stay on our side, you, you will be seen, you will be heard. It's such a gift when you use it for, for God. It's very unique. But when you go over there, yes, yeah, a bunch of y'all that have sold out. It's a whole lot of y'all that have said, listen, I don't want to stand for what's right. I don't want to stay in my father's house and serve. I want to take everything that you promised me and I'm going to try to get it somewhere else. This is what he did. He went to a faraway land. He didn't go to that land to get broke. He, he went there with loose living, trying to think that he can just do what he wanted to do and get whatever he wanted. Why? Because he, he, he didn't understand that God lets you lose, live loosely within his presence as long as you're living for him. But if you step outside of his presence, then listen, it's going to be hard out there for you. It's easy in here. You can wake up and go to sleep when you want to and do. But when you get out there, you got to really ground. If y'all don't know what I'm talking about, find somebody that's been living with their mama all their life. And now they got to get out there and try to fend for themselves that's a hard transition yes, college is. has benefited a lot of us to make things kind of smooth but anybody that missed college and went from mama's house to my own apartment it's not an easy thing it's a hard transition and so here he is in this life he's lost his mind and now he's lost his possession who would be lost his possession to to the enemy he lost his possession to the enemy but this is what kills me about this dude he's lost his mind asking his daddy for what don't belong to him he lost his possession out there trying to live like he shouldn't be living but then he fools around and he loses his own value within himself you know why because he goes and he says you know what the famine comes and he says listen I, I'm going to sell myself out to somebody within the city I'm going to sell my the Bible says a citizen so that was somebody local that he sold himself out to during a famine. I want you to catch this before we move on to this next point. I want you to understand, listen, God withholds from you what you want because he has a time for you when you will need it. He withholds from you what you want because there's a time for you when you will need it. I want, I want you to really understand that was a famine and the land in this country where he was, but the Bible doesn't say that it was a famine where his father was. There was plenty there. But even if the famine had attacked where his father was, the, the, the provisions would have been there for when he needed them. But the fact of the matter is, some of us are running around asking God for what we want, and we're not even ready for it to make it a need. Come on, let's be honest. Some of us declaring that we need this husband by a certain age, and he needs to look a certain way, but we ain't got our own lives right. You know, everybody wants this money, this extra money. Lord, if you just give me this raise, if you give me this, this extra promotion, if you just put this money in my pocket, I'm going to do this for you. But have you done for God with what you have now so that he can trust, for, trust you that when I do give this, you will treat it as if it's a need and not a want? Because you know what happens with a want? You just treat it any kind of way. Eventually, a want gets played out. You know, it's kind of like when Isaiah goes to the store and he says, listen, daddy, I've seen this car. I want this car. Can you get me this car? And he wants this car. And so I will get him this car. And when I get him this car, we go home. And before you know it, I ask him, Isaiah, where's your car? He doesn't even know. Oh, dad, I just wanted that then. It looked good then. I don't, I don't care, daddy. I, I want to play with one of my other toys now. He doesn't care. Clean up under the couch and there it is. He doesn't care about it because it was what? A won't. But there's a thing that he has called a leapster. And the leapster educates him. He gets to play games and things like that. Things that he needs for school. So when he's struggling, he says, Daddy, let me just try it on my leapster. It's a need. And he keeps up with what he needs. But he neglects what he wants. That's the same thing that applies to our lives. Listen, that's the reason that Bible said, let the children come unto me. If, if you want to be a better Christian, try to be a better child. Be everything that you expect your child to be to you. And you do it to God. Here it is that he shows us if, if you need it, I'll give it to you. But if you want it, you're going to waste it. And so here it is in the text that he, he loses his mind. He loses his possession. And the last thing that he does is he loses his value. Why does he lose his value? Because he says, I'm going to sell myself out to a citizen of this land where there is a famine as a hired servant. Now, that doesn't make sense. I'm going to sell myself to a citizen in the land 
where it is a famine. Obviously, he thought this citizen had something for him because he had little livestock stored up and things of that nature. And so he went and sold himself out to this citizen. The Bible says that he was feeding the swine. And he got down and he was about to, as he was feeding the swine, he got to a point. I really want you to read this for yourself. Let's look at verse 16 through 17. Because I really want you to make, make sure I'm not making this up. Verse 16 says, And he would have gladly filled his stomach with pods that the swine were eating and no one were giving him anything. Verse 17, But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger? Verse 18, I will get up and go to my father and I will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Verse 19, I, will, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired hands. This is the definition of losing your value, where you begin to look at yourself as less than what God has created That's you to be. That's a word. This dude... Not only did he sell himself out to be a servant of someone else, but then he goes and he says, listen, my daddy people make more money than this. Man, I'm just going to go to my daddy. I'm going to tell my daddy, listen, I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. Just make me a servant and I'll be okay with that. The thing about it, it is, is if he's your daddy, he will always be your daddy. No matter what you do for him, no matter how much you work for him, if he is your father, he will always be your father. You, you can't change that. But in his mind, because he's in a bad mental state, we've established that he's lost his mind. It has caused him to devalue who he is. I want you to understand how jacked up this dude value is. Not only does he lose everything that he has, but he works for a man. And, and this is what gives, gets me. In, in the end of verse 16, it says, and no one was giving anything to him. Listen, I'm working for you feeding your pigs and you're not giving me anything? I told the church earlier this morning, I said Texas workforce must not have been in play back then. That's against a labor law right there. I'm going to work for you and you're not going to give me anything? And it gets to the point that it's so bad that he is eating or attempting, planning to eat the slop that everyone else has thrown away. What do you mean that everyone else has thrown away? Remember, it's a famine in the land. And on famine time, that means master eats first. And not only does master eat first, but master and his family gets dibs on leftovers. As long as it's good, we're going to hold on to it. Why? Because there's a, a famine in the land. And then after we see that it's no longer good for us, then we give it to the servants. But there's a famine in the land. So this process that used to be like master got the grade A steak on Monday and you get it Monday evening, you don't get to look at that steak until it's Friday. Because there's a famine in the land. We got to hold on to these things. We're we, we, we not pushing it out like we used to push it out. We're not eating as much as we used to eat. And so here it is that master has given it to the servants, which was a process. You know, the servants, they're grateful, but they're going to hold on to it because it's going to be a process for them. And then what's left over, if anything, because there is a famine in the land, we feed it to the swine. Mm. Mm. To be honest, we might feed the swine before we feed the servants. Mm -hmm. Because I, I got to make sure they eat. Got to make sure they stay healthy. That's it's a famine. That's, that's my food. So in other words, this has went through a process that has caused him to miss it until it gets to the end. And he's down there saying, you know what, I'm going to try this. Some of us sell ourselves out for anything all the time. We know that God has promised us great things, but we will sell ourselves out for a whole bunch of nothing just because of the situation and the circumstances that we have found ourselves in. Listen, I need you to catch this. You're in that situation, number one, because of the way you thought got you there. Stop playing blame game 
on God. I was telling the earlier service, we just went on this cruise and there were people in the casino and I seen this one lady on roulette and she put $100, might have been the only $100 she had on number 14 and she stood there and prayed, God, please let 14 hit. Please let 14 hit. 17 hit, not 14 hit. And she lost her mind. God, how could you do this to me? Listen, God didn't do this to you. He didn't tell you to put that $100 on 14. You know why you put that hundred dollars on fourteen? Because you thought you could turn a hundred into thirty-five hundred. That's what you thought. So, in other words, you were ungrateful for what you have already had, and you thought you can turn it into more. And now, because it didn't turn into more, you you upset with God about it. Some of us are doing the same thing in our lives right now. God has already given you one thing, and because you couldn't turn it into more like you thought because you were looking through other people's lenses, now you upset and you like, God, how could you do me like this? I'm so lonely and I'm all by myself. Well, you didn't take care of the five or six. I sent you the first time. I'm broke. I need a job. What about the 10 I gave you last year? We so busy taking, taking, taking. All we want is our inheritance. Give me what you promised me. And we don't realize how much damage we're doing to our own selves. I'm glad God loves me enough not to give me what I want when I want it. We started this 8 o'clock service today. You know, I'm all crunk. We got the commercial. We got the billboards. God going to flood the house. We might have had 10 people here. And I, at the end of the service, I said, thank you, God. Why? Because if he would have let this place be packed out with that early morning service, I would have lost my mind. I would have been like, you know what? I got this thing. So sometimes I got to be grateful for the little things. That God gives me. Why? Because it, it shows me I won't go through a process. So when I get to a point, I will appreciate it. That's what was wrong with this young man that lost his inheritance. See, he, didn't, he missed the whole process, the loss, losing someone. See, that's a process in most people's lives when you're really connected to someone that you love. That and you lose them, you don't care what you get when they die. I know we got some family members that want to fight over who going to get the car and who going to get the house and how much. We, we all got that in the house. But you can really know that person that loved Big Mama or whoever because when they really lose them, they don't want to get mad. I don't want to talk about this right now. Mom, Big Mama just died. He missed that phase of his life, that hardship, that moment of grinding, that moment of going through so that when it's all done, he can appreciate whatever it is that he got. So he got, without losing, mm. without struggling, without working for it, and as a, as a result, he lost everything. He lost everything. Mm. Which brought him to a point to devalue himself. To say, I'm less than what I'm created to be. This is the beginning of the series, Lost But Found. Like I say, most of the time we teach this text and it's about the Father's love. But I want to teach it and make sure you understand what's also within the text is that as believers, we can't afford to lose our mind. We can't, get, we can't afford to get so caught up in what's going on in the world that we're looking through their lens. Because what you got to understand about their lens, their lens is scratched up, it's scarred. It, it's not crystal clear. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's a... In, it's a replica. It's a counterfeit of what God created it to be. And because they're not happy, misery loves company. I need to make it look good to you so that you can come and be a part of it. The purpose of this, and we know the story. We know what ends up happening. He was lost, but then he comes back to his father. Lost, but found. But in order for us to, to truly be found, what has to happen is we got to fix the way we think. I'm tired of dead Christians. Not spiritually dead because some of y'all, the spirit does truly move. You got a relationship with God. I, I understand that. But I'm tired of mentally dead Christians. And the reason why it's a difference between spiritually dead and mentally dead, because spiritually dead lets me know as long as God is leading you, as long as you're trusting God, as long as you're trusting God, you are right. The problem is when, when you encounter a situation that requires you to think, and the spirit man is just waiting on you to, 
to make the right choice because you know we do have free will. We lose every time. Because our, our mental state is messed up. It's time for us to wake up mentally as a people. Not black, not white, not Mexican, but as Christians. Wake up at mentally to have an understanding of why we're doing and asking and saying whatever it is that we're doing. Because if you can't do that, you have no value to God. Remember, these parables were shared so that you may get what? An understanding. It's your chance to understand what is God saying to me in this text. He's saying, listen, you don't have to be lost. It's a purpose that is so long. Of all the three parables, this one is the longest one. Because he wanted to make sure everybody can identify with every aspect of life that's caught up within this parable. Stop asking God for tomorrow and start appreciating today. Stop seeking what God is trying to give you tomorrow and live for and with God today. That's all he had to do. Live for him in this moment, right now. And once you get to the point of you can do that, then it's guaranteed that you will never lose what God is giving you because you've stayed in the will of God the whole time. He lost what God gave him because he left God. He left the Father. So if you want to keep blessing, receiving blessings and prospering, stay in the will of God. Because for God to bless you, he don't always have to give it to you. You just got to be in his proximity. And if you could do that, then you're guaranteed never to lose your value. You'll never devalue yourself as a woman, as a man. You'll never accept any less than what's owed to you because you truly see yourself for who God has created you to be. What's holy will be given unto you if you remain holy. What's righteous will be shared with you if you remain righteous. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all righteousness shall be added unto you. We may have been lost, but we can be found. And the thing is, we don't have to wait on anybody else to find us. We just have to find ourselves. <laughs>